Hi everyone, um, welcome, thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Jen Skiok, I'm a partner in so the unmuted. employment law team and I'm joined today by my colleague Laura Fitzpatrick um, who is one of our solicitors in the employment law team as well. Um, so those of you who have attended these sessions before will be familiar with the format and um, we tend to have a bit of a focus on a particular topic um, followed by a bit of a general update. So um, for this session, Laura is going to kick off um, with top tips. Is it 10 top tips, Laura? That's right, Jen. Yeah, 10 <laughs> top tips. We like consistency on preventing sexual harassment in the workplace, which I know from feedback that we've got from clients and contacts, that's something that um, from a practical perspective is, is something that a lot of you are, are looking at at the moment rather than a kind of reactionary approach to it. Um, what can you do to actually prevent it in the first place, which then also gives you the ability to present a defence to a claim if it does arise um, that you took all reasonable steps to prevent it. So with that, I will hand over to Laura. Thanks very much, Jen. So um, as Jen has touched on, um, establishing a workplace that tackles and doesn't tolerate sexual harassment remains very much at the forefront of many board agendas. And the volume really does continue to be very much turned up on this issue. In one of our recent sessions, we touched on the Fawcett Society's report into sexual harassment at work. And we flagged the fact that a toolkit for employers is to follow. So this has now been released online along with numerous other materials, including some training slides um, and a template policy. Um, but what we've done is distilled that toolkit and the report into our top 10 tips. So um, a necessary first step in preventing sexual harassment within the workplace is to establish a culture that challenges the idea that sexual harassment is normal. Generally speaking, employees do respond to their environment. So if the employer takes sexual harassment seriously, then they are more likely to as well. Totally appreciate that changing an organization's entire culture isn't something that happens overnight. However, it is absolutely something which is achievable and the remaining tips which I'll come on to discuss should go some way to facilitate that change. So in the first instance, it's really important that the organization demonstrates its commitment to tackling sexual harassment within the workplace. Ultimately, you do want to establish an environment where everyone is demonstrating that commitment. However, sending a clear message and a commitment from leadership is a really good place to start. So strong leadership is key and a workplace that can see its leadership team as being committed to the cause is more likely to respond to, engage with and champion tackling harassment at work. So as part of this commitment, leadership should devise an appropriate strategy and should implement that strategy thoroughly and consistently. However, as I will come on to discuss, there isn't really a one size fits all approach to this type of strategy, but the pointers which we'll come on to consider should help facilitate that being deployed. So many of you will probably already have a number of these elements in place. So some, some things you might just need to be looking at adjusting or adapting rather than actually starting from scratch. So coming on to the third tip then, um, as a starting point, you want to ensure that you're actually listening to your workforce and that you're embedding their feedback in the overall strategy. So a useful way of obtaining this type of feedback is through confidential surveys which seek to establish whether there are any hotspots or trends within the organization. You might also wish to consider developing confidential focus groups with a diverse range of participants to drill into the detail and to maximise the feedback that you're actually getting. And while it's important that you do this sort of consultation process as part of the initial strategy, 
it is also important that you do see this as an ongoing duty and that you're evaluating the success of your measures which are in place and you're consulting with your employees and you're acting on any feedback that you get. Um, and as Jenna touched on, um, that would build into any sort of all reasonable steps defence if you ever had to run with that at tribunal. It's all, so the fourth tip which we have is something which will likely be at the forefront of any strategy, and that is uh, putting in place a standalone sexual harassment policy. So this type of policy can set the tone for how seriously a workplace takes instances of sexual harassment. Um, any policy needs to be appropriately communicated to the workforce. Um, and obviously you want to be ensuring that managers um, who are handling reports of harassment understand the terms of the policy and are also communicating that more widely within the, the workforce. And um, all of this really does just contribute to the development of a culture that you know is clearly showing that it does not tolerate harassment of any kind um, within the workplace. So in addition to having a robust and clear policy in place, you want to be ensuring that you're training employees at all levels of the business. Um, as a minimum, we would recommend that company-wide training should include information about what constitutes, constitutes sexual harassment, the harm it can cause, the importance of creating an inclusive culture to prevent it from happening, how to make it safe to speak up, how to report sexual harassment, um, and preventing vic victimization of those who raise complaints um, of that nature. And as I'd mentioned as well, as well as training for all employees, you do want to ensure that managers and investigators are receiving appropriate training in how to respond to um, a report of sexual harassment being made. And I think Another... that point, Laura, I was just going to say, I think that point about um, training managers is so important as well because a lot of the time um, the issues can be kind of compounded or perpetuated depending on way, the way in which um, you know the kind of first line response happens yeah. and in fairness to managers um, they may feel out of their depth they may feel uncomfortable yeah. depending on um, you know, for example, if it's a woman complaining to a male line manager about sexual yep. harassment, that just may be a difficult conversation for, for both parties. And so I think that for me is a massive part of the overall strategy is to kind of make people as comfortable and confident as they can be handling these sort of things. Totally. And actually, um, within the materials that have been released, there's a lot of... Um, focus on actually providing you know well-being support as well to managers who are dealing with these types of issues because there's such a recognition of how difficult you know that that is to manage um, and on I guess on a kind of related note um, the other uh, training recommendation is to introduce bystander intervention training so you know with a view to sort of developing a shared understanding within a workplace and making you know colleagues aware of how you can respond you know as a colleague or as a friend if somebody comes to you um, and discloses you know that sort of behavior um, so they are the kind of three strands of training um, as part of the the recommendations um, and actually then following on from that point about um, you know, being able to support your colleagues and things. And um, one of the other key recommendations and that, that actually is sort of filtered throughout many of the points within the report and the toolkit is that an employer should look at consider considering creating anti-sexual harassment pioneers or champions within the business and their role would be to raise awareness of harassment in the workplace. 
to drive change and also to kind of encourage discussions internally um, and you know looking at reviewing whether or not the current processes practices and um, measures are actually doing what they're intended to do and um, so that then brings us on to um, the seventh tip which is a, a really really important one um, and that's all about the reporting system which is recommended so um, absolutely you want to ensure that you have a robust reporting system in place which employees know about um, they feel safe to make that report and they're also able to select a reporting route that works for them um, and on that it, it's crucial when you're establishing a reporting route to remember the effect of power in the workplace on reporting so a key reason for individuals not reporting sexual harassment is that maybe the employee being harassed is less senior um, or feels that they're generally in a vulnerable position. So, you know, they fear the consequences of reporting um, about a, a more senior person within the organisation. Um, so the, the types of reporting routes will depend on the resources that are available to an organisation. Um, and it might actually be, you know, that an individual just feels more comfortable going directly to a line manager if they have a good relationship with them or to a close um, colleague in the first instance. However, generally speaking, sort of the types of reporting routes could comprise a confidential phone line, some sort of um, confidential um, report online, um, or actually going as far as to have an independent third party where you can make reports to, um, or an anti-sexual harassment specialist. Um, one question which we're often asked is how an employer should deal with anonymous reports. Um, and the guidance within the, the toolkit is that employers who choose to offer anonymous reporting routes should really do so in conjunction with named reporting routes. So um, just sort of running the two together and making sure that employees know of the limited action that can follow an anonymous report um, and are given the option to make a named report at some point afterwards if they want to do so. Um, so that brings us on then to the next tip, which is about responding appropriately to reports that are raised with um, employers. So absolutely, you know, effectively handling complaints of sexual harassment is, harassment is fundamental. Um, not only does it indicate that employers are serious about tackling um, sexual harassment, um, but it can also then mitigate, um, you know, the impact of um, the experience. Um, you know, if you're taking action um, and preventing it, you know, like Jen said, um, taking a proactive approach to prevent it from happening, um, it's really important that employers do follow through on their policy statements um, and do appropriately discipline anyone who is found to have committed sexual harassment at work. Um, and that obviously includes behaviours that may in the past have been treated as being normal. Um, so all of this, of course, um, you know, is a really, really challenging um, area for employers and, and employees. Um, and in addition to taking that action, an organisation needs to ensure that it's providing appropriate well-being support to all of its workforce who are impacted by um, instances of sexual harassment. So that links into the point I was making just about making sure managers are provided with guidance and support. Um, victims are also provided with the, the well-being and um, guidance support that they need. Um, and as well as looking at ways you can provide support internally, um, depending on the size of an organisation, 
you might want to look at ways that you could work with independent third parties who can provide that sort of impartial support and advice to people. Um, there are also various charities um, that do provide guidance um, to, to victims. And that's another point which you could look to include within a policy that you know you're at you're signposting employees to those really really valuable resources um so kind of looping right back to the beginning um as i've mentioned there really isn't a one size fits all solution um and one of the key takeaways from the faucet society report and all of the associated materials is that fundamentally um, employers should be taking a flexible and adaptable approach um, and that's really an essential po point to establishing a workplace where sexual harassment is not tolerated. Um, as an employer you should be remaining alert for how sexual harassment can infiltrate its way into the workplace, how it can vary within different parts of the workplace um, and how it can develop and change over time. Um, so it's just taking that sort of flexible um, approach and consulting with employees throughout. So a bit of a whistle stop tour, but hopefully these tips are a helpful summary of the key things um, that you should be considering. And if you do want you know, to discuss anything confidentially or in some further detail um, if you're looking at um, reviewing the materials and you know starting to put in place that strategy then please do just get in touch with us directly on that. Um, anything else you want to add Jen? <laughs> no I just think I think you're right it's difficult because from, a, from an HR and legal compliance point of view I think often what we're looking for is you know what's what policy do we need and mm -hmm. what training do we need to do and let's let's do it and let's mitigate that risk um but the the real challenge is as you've identified um it it, it is very sexual harassment is very different in each type of workplace and you may find that there are kind of sector specific issues or particular mm -hmm. dynamics and I think to really make cultural change you know there has to be that honest and probably fairly um, sobering look at you know yeah. what is actually going on what sort of stuff have you know, people observed or what sort of stuff have we all kind of let pass, you know, over the years? Um, and and how do we go about making that change so that it, it it just, it doesn't become a kind of, we have to discipline people. Actually, mm -hmm. the, the ideal, mm -hmm. the ideal situation is that those sort of dynamics and conversations and conduct um, just aren't happening anymore. It's quite interesting. I don't know if anyone's seen the adverts that have been pushed out on TV about the moment at the moment about everyone sort of challenging um, aggressive or violent behaviour towards women. And so there's, um, you know, I guess a real push from the government's perspective on that kind of call it out piece. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think we'll therefore see as employers a, a big increase in people kind of calling it out either themselves in the moment which is something you'll you'll need to manage um or coming most likely to HR to say look I'm not comfortable with with what I've seen and often these sort of complaints don't come through the traditional grievance route um they they start off as you said Laura with a you know I just want to have a com confidential conversation with someone about that and you have to tease out um, you know the, the nature of the complaint and ultimately it may be that an employer takes the view that even if the employee says actually on reflection I'm too worried to take this forward do you actually have a, a legal obligation at that stage or from a, a, a cultural perspective do you feel you you want to investigate and take that forward and that they're probably some of the most tricky um, scenarios that I've advised on where 
you know, the person who's complained then maybe doesn't want it to proceed or wants their anonymity preserved and you've got this set of competing rights and obligations because we all know we've all been on the um the training about you know for a potential disciplinary matter and um, you need to know the case against you to defend yourself um so there are some incredibly complex and fairly emotive issues at play with these um with these concepts so yeah and the other point i would just wanted to make was the dynamic nature of your policies and training um so i think on a recent law lab um we highlighted uh, a case where the the question of reasonable steps test being met um in an employment tribunal um was kind of reviewed and considered by the EAT and what they were saying was we're not really going to be that impressed if you have a nice shiny policy um, that you've yeah. rolled out once or you roll out maybe once to new starts and then you don't refresh it or you don't repeat the training. Yeah. Um, actually what we're looking for is that dynamic um, policy that is actually engaged at repeated times throughout someone's employment um, and is updated in line with the reality of, of what you're seeing happening. So um, unfortunately, it isn't something that we can kind of say, right, we've got the policy in place now, we've done the training, that will be enough from a compliance perspective. So very difficult um, area, but also I think such an important area to tackle because I find it quite depressing that we're still talking about how do we tackle this meaningfully. Um, I think people that are kind of in a position of influence, either kind of leadership, you know, in HR or otherwise, this should be really a kind of moment of we we need to once and for all properly change the story on this. Um, and also from a board point of view, and this is where I think um, from a corporate governance perspective, these things are becoming um, much more um impactful um this is a matter in which the board um may need to report in terms of their mm -hmm. corporate governance principles um so it's something that i imagine will be on on the agenda and not something you want to be kind of reactive on at all i would say um so yeah thank you so much laura that's really great and what we'll do is when we send you out the a link to the recording, Laura, should we send the link to the faucet report and the materials? Yeah, you basically just sign up via the okay. um, online portal, but the materials come through really quickly. So we can include that link. Yeah, yep. that's perfect. Um, okay, great. I am going to move on to some case law updates. Um, so we've got three cases to cover today, quite different, um, all of them quite different topics. Um, and I know we get very excited about these cases um, because we're basically employment law nerds, but all of them do have quite practical um, significance and practical kind of um, consequences depending on your workforce. So the first one is um, a case that you'll be familiar with the name, certainly Smith against Pimlico Plumbers. So this was a case that um, has already been reported on regularly because um, this was an individual who had been badged as self-employed um, but he had asserted that he was actually a worker um, so not an employee but a worker and you'll be I'm sure bored with us telling you repeatedly that workers have protection um, under the working time uh, regulations and protection under the Equality Act so there are some quite important rights that flow from that status. Um, so Mr. Smith had been successful establishing he was a worker. So this next case that he brought was effectively in relation to holiday pay. So he had been um, taking time off um, while he was engaged by Pimlico Plumbers, um, but not, um, not receiving pay for it. And now they would have said and did say that's because we were treating you as self-employed so you wouldn't be entitled to any pay for it um but the argument that mr smith ran was 
well, actually, um, because of the number of years that I was engaged by you and the fact that I, I did every year take time off, but I didn't receive pay at the point my, my engagement with you terminated, um, I had been accruing all of that um, unpaid leave. Well, sorry, I had been accruing the, the payment that should have attached to the leave that I had taken. Um, and so once I left, that kind of crystallized and, and you owed me all of that money. Um, now, there had been a previous case, which some of you may remember, called King Against Sash Windows, that held um, that you could, you could carry over paid annual leave from one year to the next, um, but only where you hadn't taken the leave. So effectively, um, if you had been prevented by your employer um, from from taking your annual leave, you could keep carrying that over. And that would be a series of um, a series of deductions. And so here what we're seeing is this, this distinction between um, the right to the time off and then the right to the pay for that time off. So in King Against Sash Windows, what they had said was it has to be both. You have to have not taken the time off and not been paid for it. And if you meet both of those tests, you can continue to accrue um, that right. And it's all payable on termination. Um, so for Mr. Smith, it was slightly different because um, Pimlico plumbers were saying, look, you took that time off. Um, yes, you weren't paid for it, but you can't say that you've accrued it and carried it over, so to speak. Um, so it was quite an interesting argument and one which um, was kind of fiercely fought on, on both sides. Important to note that this only relates to the, the four weeks of leave under the working time directive. So what we typically describe as Euro leave, um, it doesn't apply to the extra 1.6 weeks that you get under the working time regulations or anything above um, that that you may give on a contractual basis. So the Court of Appeal um, held in Mr Smith's favour um, and they said that a worker can bring a claim on termination of employment for both untaken leave and taken but unpaid leave. So you don't need to be, you know, the person in King and Sash windows who hadn't taken any of it um, and had accrued it all the way to the end. Um, what they said was if you take the leave and you're not paid for it, that a lack of payment effectively keeps building up and carries forward and crystallizes on termination and is due. So quite um, quite a big decision um, because I think a lot of the time um, what we're looking at from these holiday pay cases is a question of, well, you know, what is it really worth? Um, if it's only worth one holiday year, then it's maybe not um, as, as significant as a case where someone hadn't taken the leave for years and it all built up. Um, whereas here, um, I think some commentators have calculated the potential value of this um, individual's case of being about £74,000, which if you put yourself in the shoes of an organisation that has badged a big population of the individual's in it as self-employed rather than workers. If you, so if you multiply Mr. Smith's situation by 10, 100, you can see um, how you could very easily be facing quite a significant liability there. Um, so as I say, big decision. I mean, I guess for me, the takeaway from this case is the same with all of these cases of, that hinge on worker status. It's that um, interrogation of the classification of your workforce. Um, you know, there are a number of risks that flow from the wrong classification or sort of worrying potentially we might have a worker situation here, but not looking at it. And then actually what that means is you're continuing to um, build up a potential liability. So I think a lot of employers are really tackling that issue head on now because they don't want to feel um, that they're in a position of uncertainty anymore. Um, the other unhelpful um, thing from an employer's perspective in this case was, um, you may all remember uh, the case of Bear Scotland from a few years ago that talked about the um, breaking the chain of deductions. So if you could find a three month gap between 
um, a series of deductions, that case says that that broke the chain. So anything before that three month gap um, would be out of time. And interestingly, the Court of Appeal commented that they thought that case was wrong. Now, um, it, the way that they said that it was wrong um, doesn't mean that that decision is actually overturned. What it means is they've kind of done a little sidebar comment on that to say, mm, we're not convinced that was the right decision, but because that wasn't actually a point in this case, it, it doesn't overturn Bear. But you know, you can kind of see, well, if the Court of Appeal have given a, a provisional comment on that the next time that's challenged potentially at an appeal court level, then the, you know, the tribunal, Employment Appeal Tribunal will certainly be taking account of the Court of Appeal's um, comments on that. So again, that's a kind of risk assessment, liability audit piece um, to be looking at from your point of view and um, whether or not you think you're building up any of these historic holiday pay issues. Um, so moving on to USDA and others against Tesco stores. So this is a really interesting case um, and it forms part of the narrative at the moment around fire and rehire practices. Those of us who deal with changes to terms and conditions quite regularly would probably more typically describe that as potential dismiss and re-engagement mechanism, which as you'll know is where you're considering making term, changes to terms and conditions that might affect 20 or more people. If you um, are ultimately thinking about the way to implement that and your decision is rather than unilateral imposition, you want the certainty of terminating the, the old contracts and rehiring people on the new T's and C's, then you can go down the um, dismissal and re-engagement route. I'm summarising there, it's an incredibly complex process um, and not without risk, including um, in relation to collective consultation obligations kicking in. So um, ultimately, um, in this case, which was heard in the High Court rather than the Employment Tribunal, and I'll come on to explain that why that was. Um, Tesco had a big sort of bunch of their employees who were on a historic um, retained pay arrangement. So this had been from a number of years ago. In fact, I think it was maybe, it was something like 15 years previous to um, the point at which they were looking to make the change. Um, the These employees had been offered this retained pay let's just call it a kind of guaranteed pay protection for life. Um, and they'd been offered that 15 years ago because at that time Tesco were trying to um, proceed with a relocation. Um, and so they had all agreed, these people who had received the retained pay arrangement had all agreed to that, um, that change at that point under the condition that they received this retained pay. And it was described as um, guaranteed for life and will increase in line with any future pay increases. And their contracts provided that the retained pay was a permanent feature of their contract, could only be changed by mutual consent and would cease on promotion to um, a new role. So you can see the wording there was unequivocal. I mean, it, to describe it as a guarantee for life and could only be changed by mutual consent it, it feels to me like that had a very special and kind of elevated status um so you can see what's coming <laughs> so tesco wanted to remove that benefit um and they had offered um the the relevant employees effectively a rolled up um payment of 18 months worth of advanced retained pay um, to agree to its removal. But when I tell you that the change in itself would have um, resulted in a significant contribution, a significant reduction in the region of 32 to 39% of overall pay for these individuals, you can see why they would be extremely reluctant to agree. Um, Tesco had said, look, if you don't agree voluntarily, um, you know, we believe we've got a good business case for making these changes. Um, presumably there were affordability issues there as well. Um, we 
are proposing to terminate your contract and to offer to re-engage you on the revised terms. So, so far you kind of think that seems relatively unremarkable, um, although you can see that, you know, if you were risk assessing this at the start, you would say that will definitely be opposed um, by, by the individuals. They won't give consent voluntarily, I wouldn't imagine. Um, so what happened in this case was um, the union actually went to the High Court to obtain an injunction, which is the English equivalent of a Scottish interdict, but basically the effect of an injunction is to prevent a certain course of action from happening. So the union wanted to prevent Tesco from being able to go through with the dismissal and re-engagement. And they said that um, the High Court was in a position to grant that injunction because there's an implied term in these affected um, employees' contracts um, to the effect that Tesco's right to terminate the contract could not be exercised um, to remove or diminish their right to the re retained pay. And the High Court agreed with the union and granted the injunction. And I think clearly this case was one where um, the, the fact that the the retained pay had been given in such clear and unequivocal terms as being guaranteed and permanent um, that would effectively have constituted a breach of contract for Tesco to terminate um, their contract for the reason of um, diminishing their right to that pay. Um, this is the first time um, we've come across a, a sort of injunction or interdict being used to prevent um, dismissal and re-engagement. Your usual remedy, if you disagree with that, is to say, no, I'm not accept accepting the new terms and I'm, I'm claiming unfair dismissal um, in the employment tribunal. But actually, this is clearly tactically a very powerful tool because in that particular case, Tesco weren't able to proceed with, with the plan. Um, what I would say is that it's, I guess, a useful reminder when you're making changes to terms and conditions. So let's cast our mind back 15 years. You kind of think, should we really have used the word guaranteed for life? Can only be changed by mutual consent. Um, if you're putting in place valuable benefits, then from an employer's perspective, you always want the ability to change that. Um, should, should that be something you need to do from a business point of view? I also think there's a lot of commentary at the moment about fire and rehire. And I mentioned just at the end, or maybe mention it just now, actually, since we're talking about it, the P&O ferries um, situation, which um, could probably uh, fill another another law lab. But, um, you know, the, this concept of fire and rehire, I think, is gaining a lot of traction there was a private member's bill in the House of Lords about it recently, and Labour are saying that this is something they will absolutely look at if they get into government. It's it's kind of curious in some ways because actually it's a bit of a sensational headline fire and rehire, but actually it is um, a very tried and tested mechanism of making changes to terms and conditions from a sort of technical legal perspective. I think nobody really cares about the technical legal perspective when we see these headlines about uh, you know mass firings um i think that the headline grabbing news is that um you know big employers have um decided to dismiss people the part about re-engagement on new terms kind of gets gets lost um so i think you know, it's, it's just something from a, from a risk assessment point of view that you should be thinking about if you're going into big changes to T's and C's exercises for, from a, a reputational point of view as well, um, as well as from a legal point of view with, the, with now the added risk of potential um, injunctions or interdicts. Is that something that we've factored in to, to the change process? So I, I find that in, incredibly interesting and, and you know, um, a big a, a big change in, in the overall risk profile of ch changing terms and conditions. Um, but one to watch, I, I don't think that will be the last um, that we'll see of that. 
And then finally, um, a case called Cocker against Angard Staffing Solutions. Um, this was a court of appeal decision which related to the agency worker regulations. So please don't all log off now as soon as I've said the agency worker regulations. Um, but uh, we very rarely see agency worker cases coming through tribunals and courts. It's a really complex piece of legislation. The cases tend to get settled out of tribunal because um, they're just so incredibly difficult and, and kind of vexed area. But this one was on a very particular point. Um, so um, Mr. Kirkur was an agency worker um, supplied by Angard to Royal Mail. Um, and if a permanent position arose at Royal Mail, the way that they dealt with the vacancy was that they put that on a notice board and firstly offered the vacancy to directly engaged employees of Royal Mail. So Mr. Conquer could see the vacancy on the board, but wasn't allowed to apply for it because he was a, an agency worker. If the vacancy was then subsequently advertised externally, then he could be um, considered for the role along with other external candidates. So he challenged this on the basis that the agency worker regs state that an agency worker has the right to be informed by the hirer of any relevant vacant posts to give the agency worker the same opportunity as a comparable worker to find permanent employment with the hirer. So this went round the houses. Um, ultimately, the Court of Appeal decided that it did not give an agency worker the right to um, effectively apply for the vacancy at the same time as direct employees. They read the regulations to say their right is in relation to being notified of the vacancy. Um, and that is what Royal Mail had done by putting it on the notice board. You do kind of think, well, what's the point in being notified of a vacancy if you're not able to apply? But I think it is helpful from a hiring employee's point of view, employer's point of view, someone who maybe uses agency workers regularly, because from a cultural perspective, you can see why your um, directly engaged employees would want that preferential status where vacancies arise. So I think that um, that was helpful clarification and something that allows you to push back if you're challenged by agency workers on that. Um, so just very briefly in the news for the last um, five minutes, um, on International Women's Day, the government launched two pilot schemes. Um, one was to improve pay transparency where participating employers will be asked to list salary details on job adverts and stop asking about salary history during recruitment and um, another scheme to help women who have had career breaks back into STEM careers um, by providing training development and employment support um, to those who have taken time off for caring. Um, we ha now have the planned um, removal of mandatory vaccines for workers in the health and social care sector, um, which will be, um, I think, the date for that will be announced very soon. Um, and the final thing that I wanted to mention um, was that uh, we've been waiting, it feels like we've been waiting for ages for um, the government's response in relation to ethnicity pay gap reporting obligations, which was recommended um, by the Women and Equalities Committee, effectively similar to gender pay gap reporting. The government's response was issued yesterday and they have said that um, they will not be making it mandatory. Um, so there will be no mandatory ethnicity pay gap reporting obligation, um, which they previously thought it would be the case. It, it will be a voluntary um, arrangement if some employers want to do that. And I'm aware that quite a number of employers already are doing that. Um, but from a kind of legal compliance perspective, that's not something that, that is going to be mandatory. So that is your roundup. Um, thank you all very much for, for attending. Um, final thing to mention is, um, I think you'll all be aware we're running um, our spring summer training schedule. So there are some dates um, in June that haven't filled up yet. So if anyone wants any further details about that or to book up, um, we will provide those details on, um, on the email that comes out with the recording. So thank you all for attending.
and I uh, hope you have a good afternoon.